Kevin's kind of trying a bit. He's passable. Are you getting along with him? Is Randy getting along with him? No, I never really got along with him from the very beginning because I didn't like him. Um, what didn't you like? I about didn't think him? he was a very nice. He wasn't a nice person. He was. A, he was. Kevin, if you asked anybody in the music business what was Kevin like, they'd say, "Well, he was a prick." And um, and that's even after he's dead. I mean, he doesn't even get any respect after he died. You know, uh, Kevin Kevin was a dick. He was a prick. He was an asshole. Um, he, um, you know, he he certainly made his own bed in that regard. And um, on later on in the in the endings of my book, I talk about how. I learned a side of Kevin. I became extremely good friends with him, close enough to, to, to say that if I had a brother, this is the guy, you know, outside of Randy, you know, that, that those are really the only two people in my life that I, that I really consider uh, to be the people that were most important and most relatable in my life. And, and in that regard, they, they were basically my brothers. Uh, Kelly Rhodes does fall into that category as well, uh, as does Randy's sister, Kathy. I never had a sister, but I have a sister in her. And these are the people that were closest to me in my life at that during a time when I was developing into a human being. And, you know, that, um, you know, shaped me into who I am today. But, uh, I didn't like Kevin from the very beginning. Always hated him. Always hated being around him. I found him obnoxious. Um, he never said anything that I liked hearing. Uh, he hated me. In in um, you know, uh, it's because he 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 loved Randy. He absolutely adored Randy, and he wanted to be really close to Randy. And I'm like, no, that's not happening. And that's my best friend. You can just take the back seat, bro. <laughs> you know. Wow. Uh, and and Randy, you know, kind of. Randy was a very, very much more tolerant person than me. I'm more apt to form an opinion and act out on it than Randy was. Randy was just more easygoing than me, and and that's why we did really well together. Uh, because I didn't, I didn't mind getting in somebody's face or, or doing something fucked up, you know. Whereas Randy would would lay back a little bit, you know, and let me kind of handle that end of things. But Randy had this kindness and this humanity that uh, was attractive. And so when you saw the two of us together, you, you sort of saw, you know, the the devil and and, and you saw the saint together. As long as you take out your aggressions in the music, right, or your or your conflicts or your dynamics, it comes out in the music. Did it come out in the music? I mean, that's a big part of it too, right? We didn't have any aggressions. Okay. Um, aggressions came a little bit later, I think, in 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 the history of of rock and roll. Um, you know, we didn't see aggression in music until um, punk rock came about. The closest thing we saw to, if you even want to call it aggressive, uh, we saw Black Sabbath. And they, they, to us, they weren't trying to be aggressive. Um, they were just kind of trying to be like evil or something. And we really didn't get it. We, we didn't get the point of what they were try, trying to do. That's why it's so weird that Randy ended up with Ozzy, because we never listened to um, Black Sabbath. We just we didn't think they were very talented. Um, you know, um, Randy always trying to get you know the, the perfect guitar tone with the distortion and and you know just just this unique sound, you know. I mean, Black Sabbath were, were like like some of the first guys to really, 
you know, stomp on that distortion box and, you know, and turn it all up to 10. But, 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 isn't, we just Alice, couldn't... but isn't Alice Cooper, you know, has the, he's shock as well, right? Even though Black Sabbath was doom. I mean, there was an evil part of Alice Cooper back then too, right? A little bit. Just a little bit. He was evil. I mean, um, he was cutting his head off on stage, you know. Uh... Well, you know, actually, um, and, and, and might I point out, you know, when you went and saw Black Sabbath, nobody cut their head off. No. Um, <clears throat> but when you went to Alice Cooper, this, this was a whole different realm of music. This was like going to see a movie. And a horror movie, if you will. Black Sabbath was was to us like a, a church of e- evilness. That's how we saw it. Yeah. And when you went to see Alice Cooper, you understood the entertainment value of it. It was a show. I felt the same way. It was wasn't, kid. you know, the Black Sabbath guys to us. That you know, we looked at them. We went. Well, those those guys are really into this. I mean, they really probably do worship the devil and all this stuff. And and you know, our upbringing just didn't support um, believing in anything like that. <clears throat> but when you went to see an Alice Cooper show, okay, like let's take the first time we ever saw Alice Cooper. Okay, yes. He, he, well, he didn't get his head cut off in that first show. He didn't do that until the killer show. Uh, we we saw the Love at the Death tour. And what he did in the Love at the Death tour was he got electrocuted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and um, he was in an electric chair. Okay, well, that's not that evil, you know. <laughs> and he came out in a street jacket. That's right. And, you know... With the right fry and ballad, you know those those songs, um, you know. So he was a he was an insane person. But I get it. And, well, well, I get it. You guys really and, weren't into the evil connotations of Black Sabbath. No, we 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 weren't. We didn't want to be evil at all. We we wanted really just sort of a a show that that you know. Yeah, you did weird stuff. You know. I mean. Had we had the resources, I mean, we would have had acrobats and, you know, and 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 jugglers and things like that. You know, just anything fucked up and different and weird and 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 just just something that other guys weren't, other bands weren't doing. And uh, but Alice Cooper brought that to us, you know. And then, you know, back then you didn't have access to things like the internet, YouTube videos, things like that, MTV, which eventually came along, um, you know, and, and, and all we had was like, you know, magazines, hip parade or circus and stuff. And we're reading, you know, oh, you know, he cut the, you know, cut the head off a chicken or, or he had chickens on stage. And, and we're like, well, that sounds pretty interesting, you know, and it's, it, it didn't seem really evil because you do eat chickens. So, um, you know, it just wasn't the same thing. Yeah, but, but Kelly, getting back to, and sorry to cut you off, what about the music of Quiet Riot? I mean, the writing of Quiet Riot, you know, recording those first two albums. Um, tell me about that. Well, um, the thing the thing about that, it, it's almost a, a, a two sides of the record, quite literally, very literally. Um, we, we wrote a real lot of those songs when we had our first manager, Dennis Wagaman, um, who me and Randy really, really liked, but Kevin and Drew didn't like him. And he wasn't like a real manager. He actually was an air conditioner repairman, but he was a super cool guy and he worked his ass off to come up with some extra bucks to finance, you know, a rock band. He wanted to be a rock manager, but he didn't really have the abilities. He did, certainly didn't have the experience, but he had. He did have the desire, and um, and he did make a lot of things happen for us uh, that are important to the beginnings of, you know, what would become a rock band, you know, a successful rock band. 
Do you have enough um, stuff that, that he could uh, make you feel like you really had a chance? And that's really what he did for us in the end. And me and Randy really liked him. I dated his sister for many years, and that was a regrettable experience and a whole different story and very much detailed in my book. But um, as his sister was like 10 years older than me, and I was a 16-year-old kid, Um, but, um, we wrote a lot of the songs, um, when we were under his management, but then Kevin and Drew decided that, um, mostly Kevin decided that, you know, we needed a more professional management because we were playing clubs and we were playing around and, and and obviously people really liked us. And so Kevin said, well, we need to really up our game very wisely. I don't criticize Kevin's decisions at all regarding all this. And he was actually able to get us involved um, with not just any management, but a very, very, very high-end, professional, big fucking deal management company who had offices in Beverly Hills, a top floor of, of uh, CAA, which is a, a very prestigious building in um, uh, Beverly Hills. Um, you know, these, these people were for real. And these people didn't have $10,000. They had millions of dollars. And so all of a sudden, you know, the, the whole game plan got, like, ramped up. And um, after a very regrettably um, uh, nasty breakup with Dennis, our first manager, um, we were now signed with, with these new managers. And that's where I think everything went wrong. And I will go to my grave saying that this is what fucked up what could have been something really, really great. You know, I, I look at a band like the, my 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 best uh, comparison that I can come up to, up with is Van Halen because they were in the same boat as us. They might as well have had oars on the other side of the boat, and we were the same kind of people. We had grown up in the same kind of places. And they were doing what they did, and we were doing what we did. Well, they got signed, and we got signed. You know, we eventually got signed a fucked-up record deal. Van Halen got a way better record deal than we did. Uh, but um, and, and I firmly believe that that was because what happened was is with Van Halen... Somebody looked at them, Gene Simmons, apparently, from what I understand. Yeah. He said, this is a great band, you know, and and clearly, clearly, it was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it situation. Well, that wasn't the case for us. We had these guys who said, you know, we can tweak this quiet riot thing. In, into something that's that's going to make money because we're experts and we're looking at the market and we're seeing what's selling and the Bay City Rollers are selling and, and you know, and all this stuff. And the next thing you know, you know, all these songs that we had written with um, our first manager were all of a sudden getting changed in, into really... Uh, songs, uh, songs that just that just weren't us. Ben Halen, Ben Halen was allowed to be who they were. We weren't, and we were robbed. Yeah. We were robbed of who we were, and I have tremendous, tremendous resentment for these older Hollywood big wigs coming along and giving these little kids uh, the worst advice possible. And and I'm very straightforward about that in my book too. Okay. Um, if they would have just let us 
be who we were, things would have turned out a whole lot different. A whole lot different. You know, um, Choir Riot would have become something else. Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Kelly. Who owned the name Quiet Riot? Was it was it it was it the the management company? Was it you? Was it the band? No, when we were with our first management with Dennis, we were trying to think of a name, and we came up with a couple of names, most of which were really kind of a little bit silly, and really didn't go with us. And and Kevin said something that I consider rather profound. Um, he, Kevin had uh, played himself off as a photographer uh, back before he even met us. And, and he played this photographer role into a way to get backstage at concerts because Kevin really liked to meet rock stars. He liked talking to them. He liked hanging out with them. And he was hanging out with a band called Status Quo. And they were... Uh, uh, English guys with, with heavy Cockney um, yeah. accent. And he was talking to Richie Parfait, uh, the guitar player in uh, Status Quo. And and I don't know how the subject came up, but um, uh, Richie Parfait said, you know, if I ever had my own band, I'd call it uh, Quite Right. And he meant to say Quite Right. But in his Cockney accent, which I'm not very good at duplicating, uh, to Kevin's ears, it sounded like he said Quiet Riot. And um, and Kevin remembered that. And then during a, a group discussion, um, Kevin suggested the name Quiet Riot because he said that's what Riffy, Richie Parfait said to him. And uh, I don't think Kevin even ever knew that the guy said quite right. <laughs> but, uh, well, maybe he did. But yeah. Um, yeah. but anyways, that's where the name came about. And we but all went, who, yeah, we like that. But who you owned know? the name? I guess what I'm getting at is who owned the name, like, legally? Until recently, and, and recently being uh, maybe like 15 years, uh, nobody really owned it. Um, Kevin and Frank Benelli, when they, when they put their version of Quiet Riot together, uh, at, at that point you could say that they owned it. And that's basically when it changed owners. And, um, and as far as I know, I don't know anything about the music business too much anymore. I have my own version of the way I handle the music business these days. Uh, but um, uh, at one point, I do know that when the original version of, of Choir Riot's second version, the, uh, I just call it the other Choir Riot, <laughs> um, with Carlos Cavazzo and Rudy Sarzo, uh, there was a major disagreement. And Kevin and Frankie were on one side, Carlos and Rudy were on the other. And it's my understanding, at least as I was informed, that um, Kevin and um, Frankie bought the name um, out from under uh, Rudy and Carlos and basically were in control with the title. Now, upon Kevin's death, of course, you know, Frankie would inherit, and and that is absolutely one hundred percent just fine with me because I think the world of Frankie Benelli. He's a very good friend. I think he's done a phenomenal job with every version of Quiet Riot that's that's a, existed through the years, and I think he does a great job. What what about the re-releasing of these first two albums? What is it? What would it take? I mean, fans have been asking since, like, you know, the 80s, when, when are the Quiet Riot 1 and Quiet Riot 2 going to be re-released around the world, not only in Japan? I mean, is it, could that ever happen? What would, be, what, would, what would it take to make that happen? It's actually a really bizarre story. Uh, 
it, it's very strange, the, the deal on those things. What happened was um, when, um, after, after me and Kevin had become extremely good friends and, and, and tight, um, he came to me and he said, he said, listen, I got the original masters for the albums that we did. And I'm going to um, re-record them, and and you'll like what I do with these. I'm going to re-record the vocals, and and he had this whole thing where he was going to recreate Randy's sound, and he set up like like Marshalls in this recording studio in Florida. And and he was going to remix them, and he was going to redo some drums because Kevin, you know, as as much as him and Drew were on one side of the table in Quiet Riot, whereas me and Randy were on the other side, uh, he ended up really hating Drew, and and for whatever reason, he thought that Drew's drums were very weak and didn't give the music any justice. And he wanted to redo a lot of the drum parts. And Kevin could actually play drums kind of good. So um, so Kevin comes to me and he says, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And he, and he says, are you, are you on board with that? Are you cool with that? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I mean, I was at the time I was uh, a, a photographer in Las Vegas and not in the music business at all. And um, I didn't care what they did with with these things. But he went on to explain to me that, okay, well, the tapes are damaged. And because when those were recorded, they were recorded on what's called two-inch tape. Um, it was a recording tape. This, this wasn't digital stuff or anything. It was it was actually put on tape. And, and you had to get it right the first time. And then you did it a second time. And if you got it, great. If you had to do it a third time, you got yelled at. So, uh, because it was studio time. It's not Pro Tools. It's not digital. It's not like, oh, I have an app or I have a program that can make your bass back in tune, even though you're tuned, you know, to Mars. You know, it wasn't like that. It was a whole different thing. So, he, you know, he said, you know, I'm, what what had to occur, and this this would sound weird to anybody, but you had to take these these big rolls of tape. And I remember seeing these big rolls of tape, and they'd put pencil marks on them where you had to do an edit, and they'd write things on them and everything. And what they had to do to make these now damaged tapes, I don't know where he found them. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea where he found them. And um, they had to be baked. They had to literally be put in a special oven for a, a period of time and baked back into usability. You know, which which sounds so weird, you know, by today's standards. No, I've heard that before. I've heard that before, yeah. Have you? Okay, yeah. so you're familiar with it. Yeah. So that's what he did. He and he got them. this guy, he got this guy in Florida called, named uh, Pat Armstrong, who owns a record, uh, recording studio record company. I don't know what it is. I've never met the guy. Um I just know he gets a lot of money, thanks to me. But um, he he had a recording studio, and he paid for all this to, to happen. And Kevin spent a real lot of time in Florida re-recording these tapes after they had been baked, and and he redid drums. Uh, he even did a, a bass part here and there. Uh, but the only things he didn't... Well, and he recorded all the vocals on them. And because cause, uh, the funny thing is, is that after a couple of decades, in my opinion, and in many other people's opinion, Kevin actually did learn how to sing. Very and well, he became yeah. a damn good singer. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and he was almost unbeatable as a front man. I mean, he, he was right up there with uh, Freddie Mercury, Alice Cooper, anybody. You know, put him up against anybody. I mean, Kevin owned that stage. And Kevin could could uh, excite an audience, you know, better than, than a lot of performers. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm still alive to be able to hopefully make somebody realize that that maybe didn't realize it before. Just watch the guy. Oh, no, I, 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 think, I think Kevin is, like, an incredible singer and front, man. He was. He was, he was incredible. One of the first things he said to me after we made up, you know, and became friends again is he said, guess what? He said, I finally learned how to sing. <laughs> okay, so he's basically redoing the albums with leaving get, yeah, Randy Rhodes' guitar, did. right? Which, but what about... Which ended that, up what, being... Which yeah, ended up be, being called uh, Quiet Riot to Randy yes, Rhodes' years. Yes, yes, the you Randy know, Rhodes he years. put it out as a CD, and he put it out with this Pat Armstrong guy. Yeah. And uh, and that guy paid for stuff. And, and it was the first time in my life, the very first time in my life, that I ever, ever, ever got actual royalties for recording music. Wow. Because I never, I never made a dime off the first two Quiet Riot albums. Uh, the original ones. I never made. I didn't make ten cents. Did, did, they, um, did they sell? Did you get? You must have got some sort of statement saying if they sold or not. If I did, you know, I was not paying attention, or too young, or too uneducated, or too not well informed to know. I, I didn't know. They were only, they, I mean, what we were told was they were they were being sold in Southeast Asia. And we're like, where's that? And and they're like, well, that's like Japan, and that's like Vietnam, and that's like Malaysia. And, and you know, you guys can't even walk down the street over there. You're so popular. And we're like, really? <laughs> and and we were getting fan mail from over there. And it was like, it was like really bizarre. Because cause we were doing really well in Hollywood, you know, and... And, and you know, it, it, everybody was like, well, how can we get your album? And we're like, we don't know. <laughs> and, and we literally did not know. We seriously did not know how somebody could get our album. We're like, well, to this day. Well, 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 <laughs> to this day. Find it as an import or something, you know? I mean, you know, when you bought imports back then, you know, it, it came in a white plain wrapper. Yeah, uh, yeah. with a Xerox uh, piece of paper that told you what it was. Y you know, our albums over there in, in Southeast Asia, um, probably I'm a big star in Laos, too. Um, but, um, you know, these things had, had an actual cover and everything. When we, when that, when those albums came out, well, the first time, uh, when the first album came out, I was still in the band. They gave us five copies each. That's what they gave us. They said, here you go. Here's your album. They gave us each five copies. And we're like, oh, thanks. So let's see. I got to give one to my parents. I got to give one to the girlfriend. I got to give one to the the person that did this. I got to give one to this guy and that girl and this fan. And, you know, five albums didn't go very fucking far. <laughs> you know, to thank all the people yeah, that yeah, supported yeah. you, but that's all they gave us. That's all they gave us. So, so Kevin does the remake of the first two albums. You know, the greatest hits of it. Yeah. What about uh -huh. did Kevin ever talk about just releasing Quiet Riot One and Quiet Riot Two? You know, as like a remaster or a remix or or anything. I, I, somebody must have these masters today. He baked them. They must be somewhere, right? Well, I, yeah, I can answer that question very well. Um, and the first thing I'll tell you is that, and this is an opinion, but I don't think that Kevin liked the way he sounded on them. And I don't think that he liked the way they were recorded. That certainly is famously true. Yeah. Um, he wasn't the only person that ever thought that. Uh, the production was bad. Uh, these big wigs that knew fucking everything about the music business hired all these idiots 
to come in there and and guide these little kids through these this process of making this music and producing an album and 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 these guys didn't know fuck shit i mean they couldn't find their dicks you know in a fucking uh you know bathroom so you know we we were just so mismanaged and so misrepresented and so misled down a path that wasn't us. So Kevin didn't really, he wasn't proud of what we had done. And he wasn't the only one either. Uh, Dolores Rhodes was outspoken enough to say that, make the statement that, you know, Randy wasn't proud of the albums and all that. I'm afraid I have to disagree with her opinion of that. Only in that only because, I mean, it is true. The albums weren't recorded good. Um, and the music uh, was, uh, you know, forcibly changed uh, to not reflect who we really were. Certainly that part of things I would agree with, and I know that's what Randy believed. Uh, but I will say this, you know, Randy and I worked extremely hard to put out an album someday. That was our big dream. And when we got handed those albums, we were very proud of them. And at least it was a starting point. And it's not its not a point in your life where you go backwards and say, oh, yeah, those things were shit. That's not true. Randy never would have said that. And so I, I very, 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 very strongly disagree with her statements as far as Randy's um opinions of those albums um they were great times with great guys with great friends good or bad as things may have been but you know we did do it we accomplished it 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 was a milestone in our musical lives now getting back to your question as far as releasing um the first two albums um my my information that i last got and this is prior to Kevin's death, and Kevin's death, and that's been some time. Um, was that Pat Armstrong, that record guy, owned those baked up tapes? That's what he told me. Okay. I don't know how true it is. Um, I, I would think that if the guy actually did own them, he might have put them out because there is uh, a certain amount of demand for him. Maybe he doesn't think it's a profitable enough demand. I just don't know. Okay. And and so it's a very hard question for me to answer. I asked Frankie, now, I asked Frankie this question, and he told me there are just too many people involved. I, I, would think, there are, I would think they would need your well, permission as well. I don't know that anybody would ever ask me anything, to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> I think they just go, I, I, I really think they all kind of think about me as like, ah, eh, fuck that guy. That's that's what I think. But, you know, that's all right. I don't care. I, I do my own thing. I, I have my own life. I'm my own man. And, and, you know, I'm more of an artist now than, than anything. And, you know, I'll never forget something Kevin told me and, and, um, because it, and it was in regards to putting out those two albums, um, but Kevin, Kevin, when he was doing this process of putting out Quiet Riot Two, he he told me he did it with with a great deal of reluctance, because he says I don't like to go backwards in life. I like to go forwards. Randy goes off, joins uh, Ozzy Osbourne, which everybody knows the story, right? Um, and, and I guess the thing that everybody wants to understand you know he's writing letters to kevin from my understanding and he's not happy i mean was it just complaining not happy or was it really was he really not happy in the ozzy osbourne camp yeah that is true you know i mean i didn't have too much contact with randy because i was moving around a lot and i was living here and there kevin was a lot more stable so and randy related to kevin more as far as, you know, uh, what was going on musically than, than he did me, because I left Quiet Riot. I, three days out of the band, I cut off all my hair. I became a paramedic, and I was a paramedic in L.A. for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, 
and I didn't have anything to do with the music business, and nobody knew who I was or what I did, had ever done or anything. So Kevin, Kevin did have a tendency to write uh, Kevin letters. Uh, there weren't cell phones back then, obviously, no emails. And, and Kevin showed me the letters, and Randy was clearly, clearly unhappy in Ozzy. When Randy did come to Las Vegas, and, um, uh, and we hooked up and spent, you know, a whole night together, uh, you know, just partying and hanging out in Vegas and talking, and stuff like that. He was, he was very clear about how unhappy he was in that whole band. And, you know, all you have to do is read a book and, and, and see that, you know, Ozzy was, was, you know, a complete mess and, and the, and the whole band, you know, was struggling to get any kind of recognition. And, um, you know, and, and it was, it sounded like a very frustrating situation to me, which I didn't, you know, Randy told me these things when he was in Vegas, but it it didn't really resonate to me. I'm like, oh, you got canceled. Well, that like never happened to us, you know. And but I didn't I didn't really realize the magnitude that it was happening to them. And and you know, Randy had gone into the situation um, with a lot of reservations, and maybe. I, I, he was desperate. You know, Kevin said the most interesting thing to me once that, that I'll, I'll never forget. And I, Kevin, Kevin was a weird guy to talk to. Um, he would say a lot and he would say nothing at all. But one time he told me something over lunch, cause we used to go out to lunch two or three times a week. We had dinner a lot together. Um, he'd meet my wives, my girlfriends and everything. And, you know, we, we were, we were pretty tight, but one time he said to me something that I could never, ever believe he would ever say to me in a million years. And he said to me, you know what? He said, after you left the band, he said, Randy just wasn't the same anymore. And he just wasn't into it as much as at all, like he was. And he goes, I think that's why he left. And I think he was just trying to find a different path. And, and he, and he felt alone and this Aussie thing came along and he went for it. And, you know, when Randy first came to me and told me about it, I was like, oh, really Ozzy? Are you kidding me? I mean, fuck we hated that yeah. shit and he's like well this is different i get to write the music and i'm working with these other guys and we write all the music and ozzy just stands there and sings or falls down or something and i'm like well all right you know and but i, I could i could never believe that kevin said that to me and i thought it was very 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 profound and um and i think that's actually what happened with randy and i don't even remember if that was your original question or what <laughs> What about um, you being the ambassador? I mean, by default, you become the ambassador of the Randy Rhodes legacy. You and uh, Kelly and Kathy, right? I mean, well, yeah, that that's exactly true. And you know, Randy was was uh, a person that that we were all blessed to be very close to, and um, you know, certainly an untimely death like that. Um, which somehow has garnered so much continued interest in him. You know, uh, we all love Randy. As far as we're concerned, Randy is still here because he's in our hearts. And and to us, that we're close to him, you know, he's alive. He's here. And because we see his life in the form of people trying to be like him, people respecting him, people loving him, um, a, a gigantic fan base that that seems to, you know, uh, never go away. And, and we want, since we are, as you call it, the ambassadors, and, and, and that's pretty appropriate word, um, you know, we want to give people... Um, some part of Randy that we can. 
whatever part we can get. Information, you you want to talk to us, you, you know, you want to just look into our eyes and know that we knew the guy and and see whatever you see when you look. Well, that's what we're here for. And we're all here to keep Randy's legacy alive. It's sad to call it a legacy to us because, like I said, in all of our hearts, he's still alive. What about myths? <laughs> Some myths out there that you want to debunk. And, you know, hey, man, that's not true. That keeps, they're, that they're repeating in the media over and over about Randy. But maybe you want to set the record straight. You know, no, guys, that's not true. It really happened like this. Is there anything out there that you really want to set the record straight with? Randy was given very free reign in Ozzy, and I really, really appreciate Ozzy um, looking at Randy and saying, "This this kid's got it. This kid knows." And I'm I I feel grateful that Randy got to um, play with uh, the players that he did. Um, they were people that we respected when we grew up. So if anybody says anything about, you know, uh, Randy um, not appreciating the, efficient, uh, the, the position that he was in, um, that's completely wrong. Uh, the situation, certainly, he, did, he didn't appreciate. Yeah. But... Uh, as far as the players, um, he felt pretty pretty lucky to be playing with these guys. I know he was particularly close with, with uh, Bob Daisley, and um, I think that uh, uh, Bob Daisley deserves a lot of credit uh, for helping Randy maybe get out of this um, shell that got put on us by these Hollywood so-called know-it-alls. Mm -hmm. But the only thing out there uh, that I would debunk and argue with and have a, a big issue with is people saying that I tried to kill Randy Rhodes with a gun. <laughs> okay, I remember this, yeah. Okay, because they call me out on that one all the time. And I almost got into a fist fight with Ozzy about that. And nothing could be further from the truth. First of all, you know, when it comes to Randy, everybody thinks, oh, he's angelic, you know, he's this, you know, this, this kind, sweet guy. Well, fuck, we used to go out shooting guns all the time. And, you know, and personally, I love guns. I'm a, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big gun guy and all that. All my life I've been that way. And um, we had we had a fight me and Randy, uh, that, that I write very frankly about in my book. And people say that I tried to shoot Randy Rhodes. Well, that's not true. I fired a bullet through the ceiling right above my head. So if anybody came close to being shot, it was me because the gun was by my face and the bullet probably missed my face by about six inches. So the bullet went nowhere near Randy Rhodes. And in no way would I ever try to kill my best friend. And yes, afterwards, a pretty good fist fight ensued, a rather violent one. And um, and and he, you know, left my house bleeding pretty badly. So did I. Um, but you know, that's what friends brothers do is is they roll around on the ground and beat each other up. And that's all it was. And people like to make a bigger deal out of that than it was. And and I could name specific people because there are events out there that happen, and I'm not invited to play in them because of, of that whole situation. And fuck them is what I say. I don't want to be in your event anyway. Um, I'm not trying to be a rock star. You guys are by playing other people's songs. And, you know, I appreciate any tribute to Randy, but that there are things out there that I'm not invited to for that very reason. So 
you know, people have made a big deal out of a, a fight between two best friends who are brothers and and have construed it in a completely negative manner than it actually was. And in no way did I try to kill Randy Rhodes. In no way. All right. Angels with Dirty Faces. We've been, in a way, we've been indirectly talking about you and your book. And I think you've mentioned so many great points that people are going to run out and buy this book. Trust me. People who watch the show are going to run and out and buy your book. And I know your book is not only about Randy Rhodes, but it's your story as well, right? From a young lad. Exactly. And, and maybe you want exactly. to talk about the other parts of the book that are not about Randy to entice people to go out and buy it. Right. Well, you know, it, it's a, when people ask me to describe the book, I, I always say, well, it, it starts off with, with, you know, basically two kids who want to grow up and be rock stars, and they go through this adventure in Hollywood in, in a very iconic time, and, and we're hanging around all these people, and, and you know, um, you know, we're just little kids, and and then we grow up a little bit, you know, and and then we get locked into this this quiet riot thing, and then in the end, you know, we have this terrible fight, and um, which, by the way, I might add, when I was I was thrown out of quiet riot, I was kicked out of quiet riot. I have no problem saying that. And I also don't have a problem saying that I pretty much set the bar for getting kicked out of bands. Um, you know, even Kevin got kicked out of Quiet Riot. So, you know, yeah. I, I guess I'm not so bad. Everybody's been kicked out of every band. I mean, God, I mean, all these bands out there, Rat, Great White. I don't, I don't, I'm Queens, right? I, I don't know. I don't pay too much attention to them. I see things online and it's, I'm like, you know, you know, these guys are getting kicked out of their own bands, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm not so bad, you know, but, but I, I did do it pretty well, you know, because yeah. once I started pulling guns out and shit, you know, oh, all yeah, these, no, uh, no. you know, all these people started going, all right, that guy's too out of control, and he has to go. Which, which all these years later, as a, as a grown adult, reasonable, mature adult, um, I, I agree, you know, yeah, get out of control, but get that fucking guy out of here. You know, I have no problem with, with me leaving quiet riot whatsoever. I deserved it. Totally deserved it. I earned it. But I will say Randy called me up after I got out of jail the next day and he was laughing because I got thrown in jail over the whole deal and he didn't. And, um, uh, cause we had, you know, I mean, Randy and I got the SWAT team called on us once um, so, at so, my house. Well, I mean, when you fired that gun, you got thrown in jail the next day. Is it like the neighbors who said, there's a gun fired and the police came? Is that it? No, what happened was is is um, I got in my car and I was very angry. And my information was was that Kevin was down at the record plant doing the finishing vocals on Quiet Riot 2, which I did all the bass on. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's where Kevin was. And I said, well, if I can't get Kevin, because the fight was about kicking Kevin out of the band. And, and, and that's what me and Randy were arguing about. And, and it's all in great detail, word for word, in my book. And I, you know... We got in, into the, the mix over it, and the gun got fired, and we got into a fist fight, which I, I probably got in over a dozen fist fights with Randy and um, throughout the years, and probably even more than that with Kevin. But uh, that's just how it is. You know, that's just how guys are. That's how brothers are. That's how guys in bands are. You fight. You love. You know, you cry, you say you're sorry, you fire a gun. and then you do it again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, no, we, we used to play with guns all the time out at my house because um, I lived in the middle of a barrio uh, full of Mexicans, and they were always shooting off guns. Somebody's birthday, everybody goes out in the backyard and shoots off guns. You know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so shooting off guns was no big deal where I lived, so... 
pulling out a gun to make my point and make a big loud noise and say, which was sort of my way of saying, just shut the fuck up. Um, you know, it wasn't a big deal. And so after Randy left my house uh, with the aid of a friend who was sitting right there and who will back up everything I'm saying, uh, Kim McNair, very good friend of me and Randy's, one of our best friends, probably our, our very best friend, because he had been with us way before Choir Riot. Um, uh, you know, I my information was, was that Kevin was down at the record plant in Hollywood. I lived in Van Nuys, California. I was very drunk. I had robbed a bar the night before and stolen all their liquor. That's why Randy was at my house because we were drinking, and we had been drinking for about six hours straight. And um, I was very drunk. And after Randy left, I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this deal. I'm going to fucking go blow Kevin's ass away now. And I got in my car, and I tried to drive clear over to Hollywood, which was like 25, 30 miles away. And I was going to kill Kevin. That was my my big drunken plan, and um, I as soon as I got in my car and started driving, I realized I couldn't drive. <laughs> I, I I didn't have the ability, and I was like, oh fuck, god damn it! Well, there goes that plan. All right, well I'm going to have to go home. So in order to park in front of my house, I had to go around the block. And I went around the block, and I had to go into a major intersection. And when I made that turn, I totally blew the turn. And there was a, a LAPD car right there, saw me do it. And they pulled me over in front of my house. And I had the gun in the shoulder holster and everything. And they um, um, had me get out of the car. And I, I showed them the gun immediately. And then the next thing I knew, I was on the ground. And the only thing I remember after that was waking up in jail with my face covered in blood. Wow. Did they press charges or were there any criminal charges? I was charged with uh, Drunk DUI, of course. Yeah. And I was also charged with uh, uh, felony concealed weapons permit or concealed weapon. Um, the only reason I say permit is because I've been carrying a gun now for 35 years in Nevada legally. Because uh, up here you can get a permit, uh, as you can in a few states. But um, uh, so I was charged with with a felony possession of a concealed weapon, and because it was loaded, that was a separate felony. Well, you know what? That that alone will entice people to buy your book and see, you know, read about the more details of it all. I think, you know, it's <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a great well, I story. Lived through it. I did it. You know, I copped to it. I admit it. I know what I did, you know. And, you know, I'm not going to lie about it. And I'm not going to um, try to, you know, sugarcoat it. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Uh, the next day, you know, after I got out of jail, I called up Randy and I said, fuck, man, I ended up in jail over that fucking thing last night. You know, because I knew if I just, if we just talked, you know, he wasn't going to be mad because we, we never stayed or got mad at each other. We might beat the shit out of each other, but we weren't mad. Um, and, you know, and he was like laughing about it and everything. But then we stopped laughing when the management got involved and Kevin went to the management and he said, okay, now he's pulling guns and he's saying he's going to kill me and this guy has to go. And these old men, you know, were going, yeah, that's not, that's not going to work with all the money we have invested in you. That guy's got to go. And I, I gracefully accepted it. I, I, I didn't argue. I said, yeah, I don't blame you. I, I didn't fight it. I didn't. I didn't say no. We started this thing together, and and we're going to see it out together. I didn't. I didn't. Never did I utter those words. I just said, okay, fine. I don't blame you. I yeah. fucked up. I fucked up. Is there anything else? Last request. 
No, I pretty much, uh, I'm done. I'm uh, taking the stopwatch off you. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> so you're good. <laughs> I think we might have to make this a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you want to, you know, do whatever you want. You know, I, I told no lies. I told the truth. I, I say what I feel. I did have a hard day. Um, my brain is a little bit taxed. I don't know how sharp I was. I I'm pretty right. good in interviews. I've done 8 million of them, but I really got the shit beat out of me today. And, um, you know, I hope I, I hope I gave you something that you can use. I think you did a great job and I appreciate all your time. Thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you what I appreciate is that you want to know about Randy and that you're putting it out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're making the effort, and I can't tell you how much uh, that means to me. Well, everybody, pick up Angels with Dirty Faces and listen to The Who. <laughs> there you go. All right, Kelly, thank you very much for the interview.